Lord, he is God. And we worship him today. God the Father is a good, good Father. There is none like him. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb which takes away the sins of the world. Praise the name of the Lord. I know you are uh, here today to worship him and lift up the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I pray that as we've been in service uh, thus far, your heart has been blessed. I pray that you are ready to receive the word of the Lord and that God is speaking to you. For without the word of the Lord, you can't do a whole lot. In fact, Jesus said it this way in John the 15th chapter, you can do nothing without me. Anybody read that like I read it? Amen. So we need him, we need his word, and we praise God for another opportunity to share. You're in the right place, amen, at the right time. We are currently in a series, if you have been here or haven't been here, maybe watching online, uh, we're in a, a series, The Parables of Jesus, and today we're going to be coming from Luke, the 15th chapter, with a very familiar passage. In fact, uh, Charles Dickens, a famous author, uh, said this is one of the greatest stories ever. Uh, it's a parable of Jesus, and so we're going to go today and we're going to consider the prodigal son. However, I don't want you to focus on the son. Amen. You'll catch it in a second. I want you to focus on the father. The good, good father. Amen. If you'll stand where you are, and there's just a passage of scripture that I want to read from gospel according to Luke, and we will share on either end of the passage, but in the interest of time, I want you to go to verse 17. If you have it, say amen. amen. And it reads, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. We know God's word is already blessed. Lord, we thank you. For one more opportunity. We thank you today. You are a good, good father. You are a gracious God and a great king above all kings. Lord, speak now through your word to these hearts who are listening. I pray they hear the parable of Jesus and take it to heart. And Lord, that you move upon hearts as you see fit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 If I were to give the sermon the title, simply be the forgiving father. The Forgiving Father. Luke, the 15th chapter, verses 11 through 24. And we look at the parables of Jesus. We know that as we've been, this is our fifth sermon in this series. And we know that as we've been discussing that a parable is an earthly story with a spiritual or heavenly meaning. 
If you have been paying attention to the word of God, then you have heard over the last few weeks that you need to have the right soil for your heart. Some soil is not what it should be, and there needs to be right soil. Then I preached uh, just a few, a week after that, that one of these days, God is going to separate the wheat from the tear. And we don't need to be worried about who's the wheat and who's the tear. We just need to let God sort it out. Amen, somebody. Amen. Then I preached to you and the Lord spoke through his word about having the right foundation. Building on solid rock, instead, which is Jesus, which is instead of sand, which is a shifting and sinking Foundation. And then last week we said simply RSVP. Respond if you please. And I pray that someone has responded to the message of the cross. Today I want to look just simply at this parable. And I know it is entitled The Prodigal Son in every Bible I've ever seen. It's called The Prodigal Son. But if you read the entirety of the text, verses 11 through 32, you will see the word Father. Mentioned more than any other word. Father is mentioned. In. So the son always seems to get the spotlight, yet the father is the focus. Tell somebody that today. The father is the focus. This is a wonderful parable, and it has multiple lessons in them. And I would not do it justice if I tried to hit everything. But I do want to hit a few things today as we consider this text. In the previous two parables prior to this story, we see an owner going out and looking for something that is lost. Whereas in this story, we will see the father waiting on something that is lost. Jesus here, as he is speaking, if you go back to the beginning of chapter 15, he says at the end of 14, he who has ears, let him hear. Yet he consistently runs into Pharisees that say they have ears to hear, but they're not really hearing what Jesus is saying. Amen. Amen. So here, Jesus challenged the leaders because let me tell you something in case you didn't know. Jesus knows what you're thinking. He even knows right now. I hope he hurries up so I can go eat. I'm teasing y'all. Amen. I'm trying to make sure I have your attention. What well, time's the game? Come on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm still teasing. Y'all can laugh. Uh, he knows what we are thinking, everybody in here, even right now. Your thoughts are not hid from him. So he certainly knew what the religious leaders were thinking. And in this parable, uh, get the backdrop, he is, he is sitting at dinner with these folks that the religious folks said you shouldn't be eating with. Jesus was sitting at dinner with publicans and sinners. He was sitting at dinner with those who were not religious. He was sitting at dinner with the lowest of the low. Y'all still get it? He was sitting at dinner with those who were in the, with those who that, that said in the church, you should be hanging out with some of those that are outside of the church. Sitting at dinner. And he's not only eating with sinners, but these same Pharisee says he is a sinner because he associates with them. The religious leaders had done everything that they believed the law and the, the books of the prophets had told them to do, yet they missed the most important thing, and that was a relationship with the Savior. I know this is not quite the sermon today, but I feel the need to stick this right here. You can grow up in church and not know the master. You can grow up in church and put your offering and sing in the choir and attend Sunday school and get baptized and never meet Jesus. It is not about religion. 
It is about relationship with the Savior. So here are the ones. They're sitting there accusing Jesus of being a sinner because he is trying to show sinners how to get to God. And here's the religious lost who are accusing him of being wrong. That's the backdrop of this story. So Jesus tells one parable about the lost sheep. Y'all see it in your Bible, verses 1 through verse 7, I believe. And then he tells another parable about the lost coin. And then he gets to the parable about the lost son. And the good, good father. Amen. This story points to God's view of the religious and the lost. I want you to know the Lord has a point of view. And we would do well to know what his point of view is. How do you know what God is thinking? Read his word. Amen. So the characters in this parable beginning at verse 11. If you see verse 11, say amen. Amen. Are the father, the father represents God, the older son represents the Pharisees, and the younger son represents the lost or the sinner. We get to verse 11 and something that would be very shocking in this particular culture at that time. Here it is, the son, if you read the text, it says there was a man who had two sons. And then the younger son said, Father, give me of my portion that I may go about my way. Now, why is that a shocking request? Here's the reason why it's a shocking request. Because the children did not get the inheritance until the father died. So for him to ask the inheritance before the father is deceased is kind of a slap in the face. It is shocking. It's like him saying this kind of, I wish you were already out of your out of my way so that I can get what's coming to me and go on and live my life. Yes. Woo. Wow. That's rough. Yes. Because the inheritance would have been split among the remaining children. And since this man had two, the older son would get two-thirds of the father's portion at his death, the younger son one third. But get this, since they're all still alive, it was kind of one third. And the son is saying, you know what? Give me, give me my assets so I can hit the road and live my life. I, I don't really want to have anything to do with you. The young man is saying, I've got some living to do. Anybody ever said that? I got some things I want to do, and you know what? You're not in the equation. Mm. You're holding me back. So like many youth, and I can look back over my life, this text has challenged me to examine my life and look back and just be reminded how headstrong we can be as young people. Now I'm going to go ahead, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and say it. I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. And, and, and I know that you did everything you were supposed to do when you were young, because I'm sitting there looking at you, and you didn't look like this. But as for me, there were some times in my life when those in charge said, go right, and Christian went left. There were some times in my life when those in charge, y'all get it, said, sit down, and I stood up. I was hard headed and it took me a while to grow up and to get it and to, to dot the I's and cross the D's. I can't speak for you, but right now, today, I identify with this young man. I did not tell my mom, give me what's coming to me because we didn't have a lot. But I, I can tell you this, I was hard headed, I was hard headed and I knew that I had the world in a bottle and the stopper in my hands. I believe Cindy Lauper said it. Some of y'all was out there in y'all's 80s attire jumping around. Girls just want to have fun. Somebody else said boys will be boys. Amen. 
Give me my earnings and give me what is coming to me and let me live my life and let me be free. Let me make up my mind. I want to do as I want to do. I just want to be free. In that text, you need to see the beauty of the gospel. In this whole text, watch this. Here, another shocking thing happens. The father doesn't grab the son by the head like I would do mine. Doesn't snatch him up. And I could. Amen. Don't get fooled. Amen. The father doesn't do that. I love my son, but watch this. I might have to say, what's in your head, boy? But the father is shocked. He watches. He does what the son asks. He gives it to him. And it doesn't record that he says anything. The father grants the foolish boy's request. Amen. I'm here to tell you that in this moment we see the beauty of a portion of the gospel and the fact that God has given man, say it, free will. Free will. You are free to do as you choose. God's not going to twist your arm. God's not going to push you into a corner, so to speak. God has given all of us a mind to make our own choices. Free will. God did not make us mindless robots to do as he wants us to do. He gives us intellect and a will, and we have freedom to choose. And the issue of our freedom is many times what ends with disaster when we choose the wrong way. Amen. I want, I want you to see here, this father gives this foolish boy his request. And so advice is, is really simple. To avoid the desires that lead to you always feeling like you are discontented. You need to pray. Hear this, young people. Old folks can say amen. You need to pray that God shows you your steps. Let me pause and say it one more time. I know what it's like to be in a place and you just are, what was the correct? Stir crazy. You're discontented. I, I got to be on the move. I, I got to be on the run. I got stuff to do. I, I, people are holding me back. This gets, the Bible says, be still and know that he is God. It's the enemy that wants to rustle you up. It's your flesh that wants to rustle you up and make you think you're missing something. You know all the times I felt I was missing out on what the world looked like they were doing and was having fun was stuff I didn't need. The enemy likes to stir you up. He, your flesh likes to move you and you feel discontented. This boy, I want you to know, in his heart, he was already gone before he even asked to get his portion. Did y'all hear what I just said? In his heart, he was already there. And where does this thing start? It didn't start after he got into a faraway country. It started in his heart before he even asked for his father to give him a portion of his inheritance. Amen? Verse 13. If you look at the text, you'll see it is my goal. The young boy is kind of saying to get as far away from my father in his house as I can. I need to get out from his sight and out from under his rules. I'm here to tell you, safe place, a safe place is under the rule and the sight of the father. I wish somebody would hear me today. The safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of the father. Amen. Old guy used to say to us, he, used, he said, I used to wake up planning this sin. Used to wake up planning bad decisions. A young person here says, give me my money based on my birthright and let me move on. Yes. I'm here to tell you, watch this. We need to be on guard against that type of thought. Amen. 
as the young man leaves, notice this, the distance from home represents man's natural born distance from God. What are you trying to tell us, Pastor? I'm trying to tell you that all men are born with an inherited sin nature that when it, when you get older, it will manifest, it works to even younger, younger kids, this can happen, manifest itself, amen, in spite of what you think you can do and what you're trying to do, this sin nature will come into play, amen? So the distance that we are born with is already in us when we are growing up. We don't have, we're not born seeking God. I don't care what anybody says. We are not born seeking the Lord. We are born desiring to do what, church? Sin. Desiring to be distant from the Father. So look at the text. He gets to where he wants to get. If I have any witnesses in here this morning that know that what you saw that looked like greener pastures, when you got there, it was brown as dirt. You don't have to explain just in your amens. It's enough. I hear what you're saying. What looked good. Oh, let me come on down your road. Who looked good? Who talked good to you? Who said the right things, what looked good, what seemed like a good plan at the time, after you got over there, it wasn't what you thought it was. Hello. So he's out there. Y'all know the story. He's living it up. He's partying. He's carousing. He's living the nightlife. He's bringing, uh, he's bringing it all home. He's got everything he wants. He's living it up with his friends. He, he has one famous uh, TV identity said, he's limousine riding, jet flying. He's wheeling and dealing. Yeah. Amen. And then the bottom falls out. Yeah. Let me tell somebody, some, you need to hear this today, verses 14 and 16. And watch this. It's sometimes you get to this point, and I'm here to tell you calamity and disaster and disappointment don't email you and say, Can I get on your calendar? They just show up at your door. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. You read the text, watch this, look at the text, follow me in scripture this morning. It says, and when he had spent everything, yeah. notice, notice how God times this out. When his money was all gone, yeah. then the famine hits. Uh, and it hit before the money left. It, it hit after the money left. God has a divine calendar, and he will not be thwarted in what he's going to do. And if he brings calamity, if he allows disaster, if he allows disappointment, watch this, it will work in his behalf, and it will work eventually for your good. Watch. So they just showed up. There's a drought. There's a famine in the land. The boy ran out of money. And notice this. I want to point something out to you. His friends got scarce. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. When you had everything, when you were popular, when things were going well with you, everybody wanted to be around you, but you let some calamity befall, and you'll look around and you'll see who your real friends are. Then. Some folks just around you because of what you have. So he looks around and he has nothing. He has nobody. He has nothing but regret. Amen. This is where I drop this line here, and I want you to hear me real fast. It pays to be vigilant. Amen. It pays to be frugal. That's an old word. To watch your spiritual bank account and your physical bank account. And it pays to stay in prayer. 
I want to pause and give some young people and maybe some old folks too some advice. My first check, I'm, I'm ashamed to even say it. This is why I can identify with this young man. My first real check where I got paid for a real job. It wasn't the school system, but I worked at the library. My first check, I went and blew it on a gold chain. So that I could be, as it was called now, but, but back then, so I could bling, so people would see what was around my neck. Because everybody, I couldn't buy the big thick ones because I didn't have that much money. But I put that little chain around my neck. My first check, when I should have put some back, when I should have put some in the ties, when I should have blessed somebody else, I had to have a gold chain. And then I looked around and wondered, well, where did all that money go? Your mom said, you're wearing it around your neck. Dumbest thing ever, one of them. <laughs> Choices are in front of all of us. Let me go ahead and address it now. And you know what? We laugh, we look at the text, we say, yeah, boy, he was. But you know what? Left to our own devices, we all. Left to our own devices, we all went end up in the pig pen. Mm. left to how we want to do things if we're not careful and watchful we all could end up in the pig pen of life out of fellowship not walking how the Lord it is very easy to do if you're not careful to end up spiritually bankrupt that is the parallel today to end up outside of a fellowship with the Father. If you're not careful, it can come your way. So this young man, y'all see the text like I do, he finds himself hired out to work and he is literally in the pig pen. Now why is that a big deal? Why does Jesus put that in this story? Here's why. Because Jewish people would understand how dirty a pig or a swine is and it was the lowest of the lowest of the lowest of animals. They were not to deal with them or touch them for him to be in the pig pen means not only was he broke, not only was he friendless, not only was he in trouble, not only was he far from home, but now he is dirty, filthy, and unclean. Uh -huh. Amen. And it isn't it ironic that friends, he thought that were true to him. They did not have his best interests at heart. And even now, when they maybe could help him out of this pig pen, there's nobody there. He's at his lowest point. But not quite. Look at this. Look in the text. Look up to verse 17, verse 16. It says that he would have feigned to eat the husk. He would have eaten what the pigs were eating. But they were indigestible to humans. So he's hungry and he can't even eat what the pigs are eating. My gracious, I, I often gathered in my mind thinking when I would hear this story in Sunday school and other people preaching that he ate what the pigs were eating. But look, if you read it really careful, no, not really. He, he couldn't even digest those. Those weren't quite right for his stomach. So there is the difference. Even the pigs had something. And he didn't. Even the dirty animals that he is feeding and in the slop with, and he can't eat. Wow! What a point. He is at now the lowest of the low. He finds himself disgraced in the pen, eating husks, or trying, hoping to eat husks, and with the swine. And then look at verses 17 through 19. Praise God for these moments in our lives. I hope you hear them. I hope you can identify. Then he comes to himself. Praise God. That's grace. That's grace, church. You missed it. That is the grace of God. That when you get to your lowest point, you think about God. You think about the Father, and it's not because your mind is so great, but God will remind you, do you remember who I am? Do you 
you remember what I have done for you? Do you remember my house? Do you remember how I care for you? You can always come back home. He comes to himself. And my friends, my sisters and brothers, that is the grace of God. Something about the grace of God. I cannot explain it. What, what is grace, Pastor Scott? Grace is the Lord's unmerited favor, which simply means I don't deserve it, but he pours it out anyhow. I don't deserve any of his goodness, but he gives it anyway. Amen. Romans, the second chapter, verse 4, says that our or despises the riches or the goodness or the forbearance or the long-suffering of the Father, not knowing the goodness of God, you need to repent. Amen. Psalms 143, 5 says, David says, in hard times, God, I can remember your goodness. I'm here to tell you, you can't overstate the goodness of God. You can't overstate it. Don't let it just be a cliche phrase that we say in church from time to time. Time. God is good. And then you program to say all the time God is good. No, you need to know that you know that you know on your worst and your lowest day. God is still good. And it is his grace when he reminds you and you look up and remember his goodness. Beautiful picture of the gospel. Look at verse 20. It says, he got up out of that pig pit and he arose and came, there's the word, to his father. Now the wonderful thing you got to read between the lines is that when he came from a distant country, from a far off place, at a distance with God, so to speak. See the parallel. When he came, watch this, the father was already waiting. Yeah, praise God. The father was already looking down the road. He'd been waiting on the son. The father was waiting for what was lost to him to come back. I've I, I got to put my own little Christian commentary. I imagine the father had been praying that his son would return. I imagine that the father said, Lord, I don't know where he is, but wherever he is, keep your hands upon him. Keep him from all hurt, harm, and danger. And when you had to have him to have enough, you bring him back to me. And I will receive him and forgive him. The Father was already looking before the Son got on the road. Watch this. It says, the Father saw him, praise God, and felt compassion. The moment I read that, I begin to think about my heavenly father. And then notice this. You got to connect the text. John, the first chapter, verse one said, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. Amen. Then verse 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Do y'all catch what I'm trying to tell you? God saw us afar off and he sent his son robed in flesh to come after Praise the Lord. Thank you. This boy has to swallow his pride. Anybody ever been there? Yes. Yeah, you have to swallow your pride. And look at what he says. He says, Dad, I don't expect anything from you. But here's what I'm asking. Let me just be a servant. And this is where you study the text and understand. In those days, there were three types of servants. There were servants that were just like a part of the family. They ate with the family. There were hired servants. There were bond servants, hired servants. And then there were the servants that were the lowest of the low. Amen? And they didn't, sometimes didn't even have shoes to put on their feet. That was the culture then. This is the type of servant that the son is asking to be. I don't even want to be a high servant. I don't even want to be a middle servant. I'll just be a low servant just as long as you let me in the house. Amen? Are you catching what I'm saying? And notice the father doesn't even let him get done. He cuts him off 
and tells a sermon. Amen. Go get a robe. Amen. Go get a ring. Go get some shoes. Go feel. He killed a fattened calf and bring it for my son, which was dead, is now alive, and he's come back. What I asked for is here standing right in front of me. Praise God. That is the grace of God. Yes, amen. Father saw him. He had been waiting. And I had to pause as I read this text multiple times this week. And I just prayed and cried. And I said it this way. Lord, I'm thankful that one day you saw me. I'm thankful you saw me and you initiated the restoration process. Check it out. Again, the son didn't even get to finish. And the father says, go on and get these things for him. Amen. And he exhibits grace towards his son. One more time. Grace is when the Lord gives you what you don't deserve. Did the son deserve shoes? Technically, no. Did the son deserve a ring? No, he didn't deserve that. Did he deserve a robe? You might say, no, he didn't deserve that. But here it is. The father gave it to him anyway. Do you deserve the salvation of the Lord? Have you earned it? It, have Have you made something up so that you can get it? No. But praise be to God. God sent it your way. Anyway, in spite of you. Praise God. Now, I don't want to leave this out. And then we're about finished. Watch this. I don't want to leave this out. Praise the Lord. The older son represents the Pharisees' point of view. And it it is this. The religious uh, see this and they say, well, older son says it this way. I have been in this house and I have done what you've asked me to do and I have lived according to your rules and I have crossed every T and dotted every I. How dare you kill a fattened calf for him and give him a ring and do all these things for him and celebrate on his behalf and when I've done everything you've asked me to do. He's jealous. I can tell you right now, there was no jealousy in the church. I'd be lying because sometimes some other people see this and see that and they want to look, but I've done this. Why is this not happening for me? Let me tell you something. It is Jesus' intent to show the Pharisees again that you can be in a religious state but not have relationship with the Savior. It is not about how many offerings you give. It is not about how many times you attend church. It's not about how you walk and do all these things. It's about do you know that you know that you know that you know you have a real bona fide blood washed, born again Holy Spirit filled relationship with the Lord. The Father was he knew he's ready right then to forgive. And that is the beauty of the story. It's not really about the son. It's about the father's forgiveness. Amen. I can look at my life and yes, sometimes I look back and I say, Lord, why and how dumb I was and all these things that I did. But then I focus that the father on my worst day, he forgave me. He's a forgiving God. Come on, singers. You say it this morning. He's a good, good father. Yeah, he's a good, good father. He loves me even when I didn't want to be loved. Can I tell you my testimony? I grew up in church. I I know how church goes. I, I know how to look church and sound church. But I had to meet the master for myself. I had to know who he is. It wasn't good enough for me to ride in on mama's salvation, on grandma's salvation. I heard that Jesus died for me, and it had to be personal. God forgives. David knew it. Amen. Moses understood it. 
Amen. Jesus told and even on the cross of Calvary, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You're in the them. Amen. Somebody ought to give God some praise. He was talking about you. Talking about me. Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 13, says it this way. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once Afar off, praise God, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I don't deserve to be saved. I don't deserve to go to heaven. But the Father saw me afar off. He sent his Son, the only true way to heaven. He sent the remedy for my sin and your sin. And what it is that why I give him the glory is that I know I don't deserve it, but just like a good, good father, he poured it out anyhow. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He lived and died to take away my sin. Pastor, when did he do this? Well, he did it on a Friday when they brought him up to a hill called Calvary. Y'all know the story and on the hill called Calvary, Jesus who wanted to please his father. He allowed cruel men and, and cruel people to hang him to the cross of Calvary. Soldiers nailed his hands to the cross. Nailed his feet to the cross. Praise the name of the Lord. And on that Friday when my Savior, your Savior, hung between the heavens and the earth. God was pleased with his sacrifice. Do you believe it? He took our place. And far be it from me to look around and deserve or see who deserves forgiveness and who does not. For I was such a one that was in need of forgiveness. The Lord opened his arms freely for all of us. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you trusting today in the right Savior? Are you trusting in the Savior who has done for you what you could never do for yourself? I'm here to tell you, Jesus suffered, bled, and died. They took his lifeless body down, placed it in a borrowed tomb. But thanks be to God, on the third day, for my justification, just as if I never sinned, he got up with all power. And when the enemy comes my way, and tries to tell me, Christian, you're no good. Christian, you haven't done this right. Christian, you know what you used to do. I throw it back up in the face and say, yes, but Jesus died anyway. Yes, but Jesus took my place. Yes, he's the propitiation for my sins. Yes, I was a no good, rotten, filthy sinner. But I am covered by the blood of the Lamb. Praise the name of the Lord. God is good. And he's a good, good father. He loves me more than I'll ever know. I'll spend it and you'll spend eternity trying to figure out why does he love us so much? It's because of his son. Amen. As you stand to your feet today, I want to let you know Jesus is coming again Real soon. I don't know when. I don't have the calendar. All I can do is look at what the Word of God says. And it does not take a rocket scientist to look around at all that is happening and you can see. Now here is what you need to know. When he comes and when he stands in the clouds for the rapture of the church, he will not miss one person that belongs to him. Amen. Do you belong to God today? Do you belong to the Father? Have you accepted the Father's free gift of salvation through his Son? Are you walking in newness of life because not of what you've done, not because you got baptized, but because Jesus has shown you the way of salvation? And you have simply taken him at his word 
and trust in him. If you have not done that, we plead every Sunday. That's why I tell folks when the invitation is given, pray. Pray that somebody truly hears the truth of the gospel. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Do you trust Christ today? Do you believe he is who he says he is? Because one of these days we all will see him face to face, eyeball to eyeball. The only question is will you see him as judge or will you see him as savior? The doors of the church are open and the Lord has spoken. The Father is a forgiver of sin. Yes, he is. And it does not matter what you have done. He can forgive you. He has forgiven. Trust him. Take him at his word. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for the preached word. We thank you for this beautiful parable that you sent our way. I pray that somebody heard the truth of the text today. That you are the focus. You you are the forgiver. You are the one who has done for us what we can never, ever do for ourselves. We trust you now, God. We love you. We love you because you first loved us. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Thank you, Lord, for your wondrous gift of salvation. I pray somebody will accept that today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. As we sing the song and the hymn, truth is